too small or large. Some people who have viewed my work have said, Jerry, that is just beautiful. I sure would like to be able to do that, but I just don't have the patience. Well, that's just flat wrong. I'm going to show you how to get great results with any scroll work and some must-have tips and tricks to add to your arsenal of woodworking knowledge. What we're going to do is complete our projects and steps that we use virtually every time in the same order we tackle a project. Those steps include selecting the project, preparing the project, working it, sanding, dipping, and finishing. And we're going to give you tips and tricks along the way to make every project look outstanding and to avoid a lot of the pitfalls. When I began my adventure in scroll sawing, I went to a local home center and found an uh, inexpensive scroll saw, just under $100, and bought some quarter-inch plywood, some one-inch pine, some cheap stuff, because I knew I was going to be bending a lot of blades and uh, just wanted to make some sawdust and, and start following some lines. And so that's what I did. Went back home, practiced it for a couple of days, uh, pretty diligently, and got kind of bored. And from that point, I went to an arts and craft store and actually found some thin little cutouts uh, that I could place on the wood, trace it, and then cut it to cut out. Things like hammers, little screwdrivers, and uh, Christmas trees, things like that. And so from that point, I uh, began looking for patterns. Coloring books are a great place to start for beginners. But there also is another source. Let's go take a look at that now. You see, back when I got started, I was really interested in cutting out names from uh, pine boards, you know, and one inch thick pine. And so I began to think, well, where can I get the lettering that I need to trace it out using graphite paper? Uh, and then it hit me, go to your computer. It's cheap, you don't have to go buy the letters, and you can make the letters whatever size you want. And so that's exactly what I did. If you have a computer or access to one, you can go into Microsoft Word and make your own letters and then just cut them out and then trace them if you like or make your name and then cut them right out of the wood uh, by uh, tracing them or, or using a technique I'm going to show you later on for applying pattern. Now when it comes to patterns, you have the option of going to bookstores, but I've found the best suppliers can be online. You can even go to a major search engine, type in free scroll saw patterns, and find some for free. My favorite pattern and supply website has become www.wildwooddesigns.com. I've even made items that appear on their customer pages. And no, I'm not paid by them or any other product I reference in this video. The products I mention are products I use and I've had good results with, and that's the only reason I mention them. At Wildwood, you'll find projects for every level of scroller, whether you're just starting out or been doing it a while. Now as far as wide, thin hardwood goes, Wildwood has some, but the best I've found is at HeritageWood.com. If you need it, they've got it, or at least they can make it and ship it to you. Heritage has a good motto too, you get good clean hardwood and we keep the knots. For our first project, we'll be making a Victorian doll chair. I got the pattern, of course, from Wildwood Designs. They're in big demand at craft fairs here locally. Once you get your patterns from Wildwood or any other place, you'll want to make copies of the pattern. And what you can do is contact Wildwood and they'll be glad to send you a permission letter in case you run into any heat from a copying store about copyrights or anything like that. First thing we're going to do is take our copies, which I've got right here. We're going to actually cut the pattern down and then we're going to use something called spray adhesive for the pattern. Super 77 is what I use. It's an excellent product. Uh, we'll spray the back of the pattern and then apply it onto the wood. So we're also going to do some other things and prep outside in the shop here in just a minute that I think you'll really be interested in because it's really going to help your projects uh, go a lot smoother, especially when it comes to blades. Speaking of blades... Blade selection can be a tricky topic because there are just so many on the market. Now I started scrolling using the spiral blade that you see on the left. The nice thing about a spiral blade is that it cuts in all directions. You don't have to turn the workpiece. You simply push it in and push it where you want it to go. The main thing to remember in blade selection is the more teeth per inch, the smaller the teeth size, the tighter the turning radius, and it only requires a small pilot hole in the wood. But the more it can wander and bend, and that is bad, especially if you're stack cutting. The lower the teeth per inch, then the larger the teeth size. They cut straighter, but they have a wider turning radius and require a larger pilot hole. In most applications, I like to try to use a reverse tooth blade. The reverse tooth actually has teeth on the bottom of the blade pointed up so that you get a clean cut on the bottom. Thus, you get less fuzzies on it 
and it requires less sanding, which is really important on the more fragile pieces. Well, I've got the copies of my pattern, so let's go out to the shop now and get started on our project preparation. Now that we're out in the shop, it's important that you read and understand the owner's manuals for any equipment you're going to be operating in a shop environment. Uh, follow the safety instructions and keep your protective guards on. We have them off for the purposes of, of showing you the video and giving you a clear shot and making it easier to understand. But in real life, you need to always have the uh, protective guards on your equipment. Uh, also, it's very important that you wear eye protection. Uh, in a shop environment, things fly around and that can ruin your whole doggone day if you're not wearing uh, protective equipment and proper clothing. Now, let's take a look at the patterns. Now this pattern comes in two pages. The seat and seat back is on the first page and a single pattern for both sides is on the second. If you don't feel comfortable stack cutting yet, that's fine, just make an extra copy and cut it out twice. Now we're gonna cut our work down into more workable pieces. It makes it a lot easier working on the scroll saw. And also it makes it easier to stop and start on your project. Something else that'll make life really easy is if you have a critical line that has to be straight, rather than sawing it on the saw, crease the pattern and then apply the spray and then just simply place it on the factory edge of the board. Now we're going to spray that pattern with the crease on it, take it back over to our board, make sure that you get the lines nice and straight, and no crookedness in the pattern. We don't want any bubbles or anything making the lines crooked. Everything's nice and smooth. We're also checking it against the grain of the wood and the board quality. And we'll continue to cut our patterns out. Now as we lay the patterns out, we're remaining mindful of grain direction and board quality. Very important. Now we'll take it over and spray the pattern, making sure to get the crease. And we'll go back over to that factory edge. And once again, we'll use that to help us maintain a straight line on a critical part of the uh, chair back. As we place the pattern on the wood, we're keeping in mind grain direction, but also there's a really nice little knot right in the center where the oval is, and this should make a really nice presentation. Now our final piece to cut out for this project is the actual sides of the chair, which I showed you earlier. I have some concern because this piece has a project line here, a pattern overlap line, actually is what it's called. The remainder of the pattern is right here. That's always a pain in the neck. What I'm going to do is cut this part out and put it up next to it and lay it out on the wood. I, ha I have a concern that this wood is actually not going to be wide enough, so we'll see what happens here. Got a little extra excess, I'll just flip it off. Well, I was right. 12 inches wide wasn't wide enough, so we'll just make a pattern adjustment. I doubt very seriously the dolls will mind. They're not exactly going to rock in it. I actually drew it a little too close to the edge, so I'm going to just come back through and gently redo it and stop a little bit shorter this time. There. And if you look at the two ends, they look pretty similar. Once you get it cut out, it'll never even be noticed. Nobody will ever know. Now for a neat trick. Try wrapping your patterned up boards in clear packing tape. Now the thing to remember with packing tape is the wider the better. If you use thin tape, then it's going to take a lot longer to wrap your boards. And when you're wrapping those boards, you want to be sure and wrap the front and the back. Now, packing tape is going to keep your patterns from tearing. Wood, especially plywood, the thin plywoods, won't splinter so badly. It's going to keep your scroll blade cooler, and it's going to keep your wood from burning. Not only that, it's going to add strength to the fragile areas of your work, the intricate inside cutouts, especially when they're close together. And often the tape will uniformly remove the pattern once you're done, you're picking it off. We've also got another way to remove the patterns if the tape doesn't get it off, and we'll show you that here in just a minute. Now we're going to cut down the boards into individual work pieces so that they're easier to work with on the scroll saw. 
You can use a table saw, a band saw, or a fast cutting blade on the scroll saw. Sometimes I'll use a combination of all three depending on pattern location on the board. When cutting pieces, always be sure when you're using the table saw that you use a push stick in order to work the pieces through. You don't want to use your bare hands. That's a pretty fast moving blade there and it'll uh, ruin your whole doggone day for sure. The nice thing about a bandsaw is you can go around weird shapes, but still whittle your pieces down to a workable size for the scroll saw. Now I've held off in taping this piece because I'm going to stack cut it. Stack cutting is just cutting more than one board at the same time. All these holes, there's no sense in doing it twice if you can stack cut it properly. It took me a while to learn it, but now I can do it. So what I've done is go ahead and cut this board down. And I'm going to sit it on here on the board that I'm going to stack on the bottom. Take my pencil, draw a line across. Now I'm going to cut this, port, this board down, and then I'll tape the two together. It'll be really strong, and they'll stay together. And I want to make sure that there's no movement. If I have any suspicion whatsoever that there's going to be movement in the pieces, what I'll do is drill a hole, a little pilot hole, and put nail in, nails in along the uh, outside perimeter. All right, when we cut with the table saw, you want to make sure you're 90, 90 degrees to the blade. A good way to check that is to use a framing square. Just lay it along it and run it alongside. I've already done that. I know that it's square. This is the point that I want to start at, but I want to cut on the outside of the line. This is the part I'm going to be working with, so I don't want the blade to, to cut past that line. So what I'll do is just put it right up to the blade, keeping my fingers clear, and checking and making sure I'm not even getting down and eyeball. Okay, now that I've got my two pieces together, I'll just sit them on top of one another, and it's okay that it overlaps. Like I said, the main thing is to make sure that you got more on the bottom than the top. Now, we're going to go ahead and tape them up. What I like to do is just start on one edge and keep it really tight and bring it around. Start with a clean piece of tape here. One thing that you can do if, you're, if your factory edges are critical, sit them down, hold the pattern like so. It's very important to keep bubbles out of the tape. And you do that by keeping it tight. You can get a good application of spray adhesive on this one. It's becoming obvious. That's one of the pitfalls you want to look out for. One additional thing that we're going to do for some added strength is run a couple strands on it. Get the tape nice and tight. Now that we've got it taped together, one way that you can ensure that your pieces stay together and also help take out some bows, if you have a bow in the lumber, like we do in this case, is you can use paneling nails, drill a pilot hole, put the nail in, and it'll actually hold it. Now just make sure you do that in the waste area. <laughs> Speaking of bowing, as you make your inside cuts, they'll actually take pressure off of the wood and thus relieve a lot of the bowing sometimes. Drilling holes is an interesting proposition. Go to your local home center and try to find drill bits that are small enough to fit in your fretwork, and you're in for a rude awakening because most of them only go down to a 1 16th of an inch, uh, which is fine if you have big holes on large projects. These are great uh, with those bits for giving you nice 90 degree angles that you've got to have in your fretwork. If you don't have a 90 degree angle, it's going to go through the uh, next inside cutout, and that can be really bad. Uh, so what do you do? Well, there are solutions. Let's take a look at some of them. 
Now, if you use a handheld power drill, you're not likely to get the hole a perfect 90 degrees. Now, this one helps a little bit because it does have a bubble on the back that lets you know when you're at 90 degrees, but it can be hard to hold. It's very bulky and cumbersome. This twist drill, that's another item I picked up from Wildwood, is very handy, and they also make the matching drill bits, which you, you can get an entire set. This is a 16-piece set here. A very small, tiny drill bits. These are very handy for those super small holes. Uh, when nothing else will work, you can go to this, and it will uh, do you a good job. But there's another solution also. The Dremel drill press is a scroller's dream. They have a variety of mini drill bits and micro bits. The platform provides for stable 90 degree cuts and you just pop in your Dremel when you need to use the drill press. You pop it out when you want to use it for something else. It's a really dandy setup. All right, time to bore some holes. Now you want to pick your entry points with blade starting position and cutting in mind. Think about which direction around the inside cut you're going to want to go. You know, clockwise or counterclockwise. If you were to start your cut in the middle of a straight line, it can be a real challenge to keep the line straight when you get back to it. If the hole is really small, try to put the hole dead center so that you stay as clear as possible from the edges. Remember, 90 degree holes are critical in fret working. Anything less than 90 degrees and you could wind up shooting right through your next inside cut. Alright, now we'll just finish drilling the holes in the rest of our pieces and move on to the scroll saw. Before we start cutting our pieces, let's get organized. Make sure you have a durable table for the scroll saw and that you bolt the saw down. You should also have a way to dampen vibrations from the saw. The dampener could be as simple as using the supplied rubber gaskets or cutting out thick rubber foam, running the bolt through it, the saw, and the table. Using a foot-powered attachment is important for several reasons, the first of which is safety. With the foot pedal, both hands are available to control the workpiece and you're not distracted after the cut is over with fumbling for that off switch. The second is the ability to pulse operate the saw around corners and delicate areas. Also, if the blade gets pinched in the work and begins to flap up and down, you simply move your hands out of the way and step off of the pedal. Now, you can get a foot-powered pedal for about $25 through many woodworking suppliers. I got mine through Wildwood. Lighting the table is very important. The ability to do quality work is dependent on your ability to see the lines clearly. Lighting our work area with an inexpensive boom light is just what is called for here. You can drill a hole near the saw, insert the boom, and position the light wherever needed. Since we're going to be spending a lot of quality time at the saw, I like to clean the area up after previous projects or when I start out each day. You know, it only takes a couple of minutes and something as simple as dusting off the table and sweeping underneath can make your environment more pleasant to work in, result in better working conditions and less dust flying around. While we're on the topic of dust, scroll saws create a fine powder of dust that can cover your cutting line and float around in the air. Most scroll saws come with a blow hose that will keep your cutting line free of sawdust. Simply position the hose to blow the dust away from the line and from you. But there's more you can do to help keep the dust out of your face and lungs. I bought two box fans for $10 each at the dollar store. With box fans, you can even turn them into air cleaners by duct taping a properly sized air filter to the back intake. Use cheap filters that will still allow good airflow for the fan. Try it for a day in the shop and look at how much dust you generate on the saw. If you use two box fans positioned in the shop in different locations to circulate the air, you'll have made your own shop air filtration system for less than $25. And partner, you can't beat that with a stingy stick. A comfortable chair is a must while scrolling. Some people like to sit high on the work and some people like to sit low. I'm in that category. Others like to stand, and at times I do as well. But if you're spending a lot of time at the saw, you'll want to find a chair just right for you and one that you won't mind getting dusty. You're going to generate a lot of scraps while fret working. Some of the scraps can be used again on other projects and some are just going to be in the way and all over the floor. 
I've come up with a system for keeping the work area clean by using two small trash cans, one on each side of the scroll saw. On the left, I'll have one for scraps of varied size and sawdust. On the other side, one for trash. By the way, sawdust is excellent for compost, and that's just what I use it for. When I first started scrolling, I would burn wood and break blades on every inside cut, it seemed like. Part of the reason was putting too much side tension on the blade, but something that allowed me to prolong the blade life and keep from burning wood so much was to find blade lubricant. Just push the stick into the running blade and the wax will produce smoother and quicker cuts. A single stick costs less than four bucks and it'll last you well over a year. Now you'll also want to have a hobby knife and a pair of pliers close by. The hobby knife can be used to clear inside cuts of debris and do light trim work. The pliers can be used to really crank up the tension on your thumb screw. And in scroll sawing, blade tension is absolutely critical to stack cutting. When you do that though, don't go mad dog on the tightness. Just do by hand, then give it a little tweak with the pliers for that extra bit of hold. Also, if your thumb screw isn't holding like it used to, you can take a small piece of sandpaper or a file, roughen up the flat portion of the screw, pop it back in and it'll help hold that blade on tighter. One more thing I find absolutely critical in the shop is a radio. Long hours in the shop just don't seem quite as long listening to talk radio or music, and it's actually quite relaxing. If you're just beginning in scrolling, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the godfather of modern scrolling, Patrick Spielman. He's written many books on the subject, and one of them is in just about every scroller's library. It's called Scroll Saw Basics. Scroll Saw Basics is a handy reference and good starting point for beginners. In it, you'll find sections on different scroll saws, blades, woods, project patterns, and much more. It's a great reference. To make close inside cuts, it's imperative that not only your holes be 90 degrees, but the blade to the table must be as well. Prior to checking blade angle, make sure the table angle is set to zero. There's a simple method I use to ensure the blade is at 90 degrees. First, take a small framing square and place it on the table. Line it up in front of the blade. Eyeball it for that 90 degrees. Then to make sure, take a piece of wood and we'll mark it off with the framing square and cut straight into it. Just a little ways. Pull it out. Then we'll check it versus that same framing square we used before. If the blade is off, you can make your adjustments per your owner's manual. Once you're sure that you're squared, you're ready to get started. Now, let's go make some sawdust. Now that we're ready to cut, let's talk for a minute about the step process. On any large project like the Dome Clock, which has over 2,000 inside cuts, or the Chimes of Normandy, which has 1,600, it's important not to get overwhelmed. You'd use this same process we're using on the doll chairs, just on a larger scale as it relates to more pieces being cut out. Boil it all away and it all comes down to one piece, one hole, one cut at a time. Just work your way through all of the pieces. On big projects, I like to do the complete process for each floor, you know, patterns, drilling, cutting, sanding, finishing, etc. Put it together and then work on the next floor. It serves as a great motivator. Here you can see another project I have in the works. I've built the first two levels of the Roman Cathedral clock, but on smaller projects, I like to do all of the patterns, then the cuts and the sanding, etc. Just remember, you can do it. Fret working will give you a certain level of patience, but it's also about fun. Don't feel like you've got to get a project done. It's done in stages, so if you get tired, stop and pick it up again later. You're going to be making heirloom quality items that will be around for a long time and viewed with amazement so it's not worth rushing. To ensure straight 90 degree lines on the seat and seat back, we're going to mark off the pattern lines on the wood with a framing square and then run them through the table saw for a good fit. When you do this, make sure that you cut into the excess area of the wood away from the pattern first. The table saw has a rather large blade and if you get just a little bit off, it could cut right into your pattern. So by cutting into the excess areas first, you'll avoid that. Next, we'll place the seat and chair back on top of each other, check to ensure that they're square, and move on. 
If you have to use the scroll saw for straight lines, remember this. Due to the milling process of most scroll blades, the fact that they're small and that they tend to follow the wood grain, if you push your wood straight in, you're going to find that the blade always wanders off to the scroller's right. We counteract the wandering by deflecting the workpiece to the left. If your blade does wander off while you're on the line, don't try to immediately correct back to the line. You'll wind up with a big hump that can be a problem. Instead, gently bring it back to the line, or at least parallel it, and then bring it back by increasing your deflection slightly and picking up the line with a bit more deflection than you previously used. You can also go back to a section of the line that was straight, place the blade back up against the line, and slowly increase the deflection as you move forward, bringing the blade into the line. Also, if you know you're going to go offline, it's of course better to go off into the waist area than into the finished side of the line. Now, if a blade gets bent while you're working on your piece, I've got four words for you. Get rid of it. Blades are much cheaper than fine hardwoods, pine, and your time. It's terrible when you nearly complete a huge piece only to have an old blade go bad and turn it into designer kindling. Now as you're installing new blades, you always want to make sure that the majority of teeth are pointed downward. I make the check by running my thumb along the blade. If it feels rough, then the teeth are pointed down. If it's smooth, then it's upside down. An important note of caution here. Blades without proper tension or that lose their tension while cutting will wander and will make it much easier for you to inadvertently place side tension on the blade, resulting in beveling as well, a disaster for stack cutting. A blade is properly tensioned when you can tighten it and pluck it with your fingertip and it sounds like a guitar string. Now that our tension-filled issues of wandering are cured, we'll finish cutting the chair seat with the scroll saw. This pattern will be just beautiful when completed. When doing this kind of work, always try to make the inside cuts first. I typically like to start at the bottom and work my way up through the project. On the first cut, you'll notice that I place the hole near an almost 90 degree angle. There are two ways to cut a 90 degree angle. In this case, since I'm stack cutting and I don't want to bevel this cut, I'll make a relief cut by easing the blade to the corner, allowing the blade to eat away at the wood, up to the line and creating a space on the line equal to the blade width. Now at this point, I'll turn the work so the blade is on the line and I can take off in the new direction. Keeping proper amount of left deflection in, I'll slowly start while coming off the line until I get a feel for the deflection required. I don't want to overshoot the line or wander off. The other method, which I'm more likely to do on one inch or less wood, is simply a spin cut in which I'll walk the blade right up to the line, apply pressure with my index finger on the opposite side of the new direction I want to go, and spin the work very quickly while the blade is moving. With a little practice and a few broken blades, it'll come quite naturally for you. Remember, with spin cutting, the smaller the blade, the better it works. Now here's another great example of a relief cut. Just walking right up to the line, letting the blade do the work, let the teeth just kind of gnaw away right up to the line. Once we have just enough space for the blade, we turn the work and we march right off in a brand new direction. Old world scrollers used to cut out leaves and use a thin blade to create the appearance of veins in the leaves they were making. Thus the name veining was coined. On the doll chair, you'll note several places that have slight veining effects of looking like wings. We're going to enter the line on the tip and proceed to the first vein in. And then we're going to back the blade out to the wing tip and proceed to the second vein and then the third, leaving areas still to cut out. Now you'll note that I'm swinging wide, coming around now to the left and onto the third vein. Now I back it up and I'm actually going to go down to the V, cut out an area where I can begin here in a minute. Then I'm going to back the blade up into the original hole. Reverse direction, and then reverse the blade back down into the line all the way to the V, and take off and cut off the waist areas. As you come to those areas, slow down and take it easy so that you don't actually cut into the wing. Once they're clear, we'll continue from the V and cut out the rest of this inside cut. Now if you have longer veins and areas on the wood by themselves to make, you might be at a loss as to how to deal with it. 
This is where the small drill bits and a twist drill will really shine. Try drilling your veining at the beginning of a line, at the area you know will have a waste area or some other relative point to the other veining holes. You'll need a small blade for such a hole and in this case an Olsen 2.0 does the trick. Carefully and slowly follow the line with the blade, keeping in mind that such a small blade is especially prone to wandering. When you get to the end, stop and remove the blade and insert a spiral blade. With the spiral, you're going to be able to slightly widen the vein and create a teardrop effect around the hole, thus hiding it. Now that we've covered the gory details of veining, let's get back to the chair side and make tight V-cuts. If tight V-cuts have been elusive for you, well, fret no more. It's about to get really easy. Notice where the hole is for the V-cut in the crescent shape next to the heart. I'm going to start off from the hole and slice right to the tip of the V. Now I'll back the blade out, turn around in the hole, back it in, and take off in the new direction. Once we completed that line, we'll simply back up and hit the other one. Once you're done with the cut, you can pop the waste area out by slightly turning the blade toward it. Inspect where the lines come together. If necessary, you can clean up the area where the lines intersect with the teeth of your blade very slowly and very carefully. With the hole position selected during the drilling stage, we can smoothly cut straight into the line and begin the curve to the V for the center heart. When the V takes off into a straight line, I'll sometimes go just a tad further to ensure the blade will be able to take off in the new direction. Now using the V technique, we just back up to the hole, spin our work around, back the blade in, and take off in the new direction. Now as we reach the second V, we'll go slightly further, back up, spin the work around into the hole where we have right there, back it in, and take off. It's pretty easy and pretty consistent and it makes life a lot easier when you're trying to make those tight cuts. Now we'll just continue the gentle curve on top of the heart. Now here's a handy skill to develop when doing intricate inside cuts. It's called a spin cut. We're simply going to take the blade, march it right up to the tip, and then do a 270 degree turn while the blade is moving. And once we've done the turn in the waste area, we'll continue to off in the brand new direction. When doing a spin cut, position the hands on opposite corners of the piece, using the thumbs on the corners and the fingers on the piece to stabilize the move. If you're just starting out, do this on scrap until you can do it very quickly. Well, back to the heart of the matter. You know, it's important when doing complex inside cuts like this to thoroughly understand the pattern prior to cutting and maintain blade and pattern awareness throughout the cut. Now we're gonna continue to make out inside cuts and work our way up the chair side. Remember, just don't rush it and focus on one cut at a time. Prior to making the exterior cuts, we're going to go ahead and drill the pilot holes called for in the pattern. That way they're uniformly through both chairs. We're going to be using a number six wood screw. We're going to take the screw and actually make a little dimple in each one of the dead center marks on the pattern. That'll help the drill find home, if you will, on dead center. Now with our 3 16th drill bit, we'll go ahead and burn the holes. Anytime you drill something out, you want to be sure and use a backer board. It's going to keep your back hole, back side hole that is, from splintering. Now we'll just finish up the rest of the holes and move on to cutting out the exterior. Now that we've drilled the pilot holes, I'll go ahead and make the outside cuts. Use caution when you're on a slow, gentle line, because it can lull you into complacency quicker than anything. It's very easy to wander off the line. But if you do wander off the line, don't fret, and don't come straight back to the line. Just take it easy and slowly bring it back, or at least parallel the line. It'll be much less noticeable. Chances are no one will ever know when you take the pattern off. When it comes to the arcs, slow down. 
use the pulsability of the foot pedal to keep the arc under control. Once we get done cutting this out, we'll just set it aside. You're going to have to deal with problems as they arise in scrolling, and they will arise. Here's how to deal with a few of them. A dental pick sometimes works well for fixing small problems like removing debris from a rough type V. The pick is also handy to help punch through the plastic, you know, when the drill hole didn't quite make it all the way to the other side. You can also use the pick to widen your hole entrance points for the blade if necessary. Is your piece too big for the scroll saw but too small and dainty for a jigsaw? Try reversing the blade. If you do so, be very careful and proceed very slowly. Everything you're used to in scrolling is going to be reversed. A common problem for beginners to scrolling is that they try to operate the saw at a speed they'd like to be able to run it at rather than a speed they can actually work it at. Or conversely, they operate at such a slow speed that they try to push the work through and don't let the blades do the job they were designed to do. In the process, work ends up beveling, blades break and burn, and one is tempted to see if prep work can fly. If you've done this, you're not alone. When I started, I sent many a blade to an early grade. And no, fretwork doesn't fly, trust me. Time and experience cure many of these problems. I can't cure you of your time issue, but hopefully we're on our way to bumping up your experience with this program. Oh, and always have extra copies of your patterns handy, you know, just in case. In any event, somebody's always looking for designer kindling. The seat back pattern calls for a four degree bevel around the oval. In order to perform this task cutting clockwise, I'll tilt the table to the left. Of course, if you wanted to cut in the other direction, you'd have to tilt the table to the right. Now, I've already made all of the inside cutouts for the seat back while it was easy to handle as one piece. Now, I'm going to use my twist drill to make a small hole with a drill bit so that I can use a smaller blade to make the bevel cut. Keep the following in mind when you're making bevel cuts. The larger the blade and the lower the angle, the more the item is going to protrude. The smaller the blade and the larger the angle, you got it, the less it will protrude. I recommend practicing on scrap prior to actual cuts on work pieces. Once we finish the cut, we'll make the exterior cut, and then later after sanding, we'll lightly router the back of the bevel pop out and the front of the perimeter hole with a Dremel router attachment. After I finish cutting a piece, I'll begin removing the tape and usually the pattern will come right off and I'll lay it over in the sanding area, but sometimes the pattern is stubborn and won't budge. If you try to sand it off with a belt sander, you run the risk of breaking fragile pieces and if you're dealing with plywood, it might go right through the veneer. When pattern paper gets tough, I give it some tough love back with a can of mineral spirits. Apply the mineral spirits to a rag and wipe down the paper. Once it's on there, it only takes about 5 to 10 seconds and it'll come right off like magic. Then I can take it over to the sanding table and move on to the next piece to cut. Since all of our pieces have landed on the sanding table, that can only mean one thing. It's time to sand, baby. With the dawn of a new day, it's time to give our pieces a fresh new look by sanding and staining them. When sanding fretwork, use caution. It's very easy to break delicate fretwork with a belt sander, especially if you're working with soft woods like western cedar or, in this case, soft pine. I chose it because it's economical and it's what most beginners will use until they get comfortable scrolling. If a piece has fairly thick and sturdy fretwork, I might give it a quick belt sanding with my lightweight belt sander. In any case, it's a very light once over, just to get rid of the marks and mars. Be careful though, if the belt sander is not constantly kept moving, it will eat into the wood and leave belt marks. Don't try it unless you're familiar with the particular sander and its own characteristics. For the majority of my sanding though, I'm going to use a simple orbital palm sander. Now as far as sandpaper grit or roughness goes, I typically like to use a 120 on the belt sander and then a 220 fine on the palm sander. That's the combination that suits me and most of my work. We're giving the chair seat and sides a light once over with the belt sander, just enough to make the wood look uniform and clear the top surface lightly. Once we're done, we'll set them aside and come back to them in just a bit. On the chair back, it's obviously going to be dangerous to belt sand around the ornate top, so we're going to give it some extra attention by just using the palm sander in that area. 
We're also going to sand the pop out at the same time. When it comes to the drill hole we made for the beveled pop out, we're going to use the router on the chair back oval and also on the outside pop out, but first let's try to clean it up a bit. I'm going to give a, a super quick hit on the disc and belt sander, just a really quick rolling motion. Now I'll wrap a piece of sandpaper around the pencil and we'll smooth out both areas. Not too much though or the final fit won't be uniform. Once that's done, I'm going to test my Dremel router depth on a piece of scrap. Next, we're going to router the perimeter hole of the chair back. And then, we're going to router the back of the pop-out. Once we get all of that done, we're going to pop it in and check it. Now I'm going to router out the rest of the chair sides, except for the rocker bottom. I want that section to be flat and square since it'll be making contact with the floor. Now the plan doesn't call for it, but I'm also going to router the front top of the chair seat just for a little added character. I also like to leave a lasting impression, if you will, on work that I do by using a handheld electric burner. It lets all who see it know who made it. Hey, you never know. Might end up on Antiques Roadshow 2203. All right, enough of that nonsense. At this point, I'm going to go ahead and countersink the holes for the wood screws. Now that we're done countersinking, we're going to run everything through the palm sander one last time. Anytime you use a sander on fretwork, and I cannot stress this enough, you've got to be careful not to bear down on the work or use uneven pressure, both of which are easy to do. If you do, you're going to feel a piece snap, and that is a bad feeling at this stage of the game. Okay, we've got the pieces sanded down. Now it's just a matter of clearing them of dust. Now I simply hook up an air compressor with a hose and blow out the dust and clear the grain. If you don't have an air compressor, you could use a duster to clear the inside cuts, pipe cleaners, or anything lightweight and gentle to remove the sanding debris. Once I've blown air through the pieces and cleared them as much as possible, I'll take an old white t-shirt, wipe them down, remove the last of the dust. And then, it's just a matter of finishing. When it comes to finishing, you have a wide variety of options. If you like the natural look, you could simply seal it with a clear sealer. You can dip your work in oil, stain, or you can paint. With this project, we're going to use a nice stain called English Oak and then seal it with a clear semi-gloss spray. We'll get to that in just a minute, but first let me show you a great option for hardwood. Here are two wagon wheels on oak plywood. Now prior to working with solvents, always ventilate your work area. I'm going to spray one with nothing but clear sealer and leave it. It'll have a nice natural look. I'm going to dip the other one in boiled linseed oil in a little paint tray. Then I'm going to blow it out with the air hose, wipe it down, and set it aside. You should actually let the linseed dry for a little bit longer, but for the purposes of this demonstration, we'll go ahead and seal it using low angles to get the sealer into the inside cuts. The dip piece has a deep, rich look with a raised grain yet still retains its natural color. Since the oil has penetrated the pores, it also requires less sealer. When working with hardwoods, I always try to keep them in their natural colors and dip the pieces using this process. Now staining is very simple. You simply wipe it on and wipe it off. The longer you leave the stain on the wood, the darker the wood will become. But you might be wondering, how do you deal with the inside cuts? Well, you could use a small paintbrush in a large amount of time, but I prefer to use a large paint tray instead and dip the pieces in, flip it around, dip the other side, and then wipe it off, blow it out with the air hose, clear the inside cuts, and then wipe again. Then I'll take the white pieces, lay them out on paper for about 30 minutes. Then I'll wipe the bottom side, flip them over, and after another 20, 30 minutes of allowing the stain to creep out of the holes, wipe them and hang them from the uh, rafters of my shop. And then I'll check on them every few hours and allow them to finish drying overnight.
Now that our pieces are dry, we can see that the stain has done a wonderful job of bringing out the grain and giving the chair a lot of character. I'm going to seal the pieces using deft, clear, semi-gloss spray. Now here's a tip for when spraying fretwork. Cut out cardboard and use the cardboard to lay the piece on. The deft won't bond the piece to the cardboard unless there's a buildup from previous use. The cardboard also allows you to hold the work and rotate it around. Once again, prior to using any solvents or chemicals, we're going to make sure we're working in a well-ventilated area. As I'm sealing wood, I always use low angles and spray lightly so that the spray will make it to the inside cuts and yet not build up on the exterior. Then I'll spray the edges of the piece and then finally, I'll spray the face of the piece along the grain from top to bottom. I'll set it aside at that point and then use the same process for each piece. Deft is fast drying and dries to the touch in about 20 to 30 minutes. Now at that point I'll flip all of the pieces over and begin the same process to the other side. You can repeat this for as many coats of sealer as you would like. I'll then give the pieces about an hour to dry and it'll be time to put it together. This is the moment I just love in fretworking when it all comes together, literally. Now I'm going to square up the seat and chair back with a framing square and then I'm going to take a pencil and run it through the drilled and countersinked holes. This will allow me a mark for our pilot holes. Now by drilling small pilot holes we'll avoid having the wood split on us, which is very important. Now I'm going to run a thin bead of a Lean's Tacky Glue, which can be used on stained or sealed wood, and we'll screw it down very carefully. I don't want the wood to split and I surely don't want to strip the screw. I'll continue with the chair sides in the same fashion with the size jig that I made out of scrap to allow me to position the chair sides where I want them and ensure that the rocker bottoms are even. Now we'll continue to secure the chair sides and move on. You know the nice thing about a Lean's Tacky Glue is that not only does it work on finished wood, but it dries clear. This makes it perfect for most fretwork projects. Now we're going to secure the beveled pop-out by running a small bead of the glue around the top of the pop-out. Then we'll insert it, and we're going to tack it down lightly on the top, bottom, and sides. Once we have it tacked down, we're also going to be sure and wipe off all of the excess glue. As a final touch, we'll glue and pop in oak buttons that I've already stained and sealed to match. For the stubborn ones, I'll take a thick rag and gently lay it over the top and tap it in with a plastic mallet. The Victorian Doll Chair, from start to finish. A stylish way to display dolls for kids and big kid collectors. It's also a great way to display your ability to master all of the basic elements of scroll song. Now there's one more project I want to share with you before we go, the easy steps for cutting out names. Earlier I told you how to use the computer to make letters for names, well I've made the alphabet in upper and lower case and I keep them in a plastic multi-drawer cabinet. Anytime I want to make a name I just pick the letters out, draw a straight square line on a board and lay them out. As you lay out and trace the letters, remember that you want the combined letters to lay flat on a desk or a headboard so make sure they're all at the same point on the line. Now as you're penciling out the letters, it's okay and actually beneficial that they slightly overlap. Once the letter is completed, we're going to erase where the two letters come together and draw gentle connectors so that all of the letters will be attached to the same piece of wood. And we'll just continue to do that for all of the letters of the name. It really is important that these connectors really flow into the next letter so that the name will have strength after it's cut out. And with the name traced out, that means it's time to cut it out. Now, as you cut the name out, you're going to want to already know how to deal with the inside loops and holes that come with letters like A and V. 
If you like, you could of course drill pilot holes and make the inside cuts. For the L and the A in this case, I've elected to let the blade simply flow into the letters into the areas that need to be cut out. This is handy if you ever wanted to make names at a craft fair because it's much quicker and allows you to move quickly to the next name to cut out. I'll usually cut the entire name out and then deal with the flowing cuts into the letters like L and A in this case. And when I, when I slide in with the blade, I'll just continue on around inside the loop and then come right back out the same way I went in. It's just that easy, cutting out names. Now you can sand, stain, and seal to your taste. Before we go, I want to leave you with some final tips. Scrolling perfect circles can be kind of difficult. If you need a nice, surefire, clean, and even hole, try using a Forstner type drill bit. They bore super smooth holes and have sizes available for the clock inserts you'll find in all the major scrolling catalogs, including Wildwood. You can get a 16 piece set on eBay for as low as 20 bucks. Not a bad deal. Need a 45 degree bevel on your fretwork edge? I bought this disc and belt sander for less than $100 at the home center. It's perfect for sanding bevels of any degree, including the more difficult 22 and a half degree bevels required on the dome clock. If you just can't get one though, you could use a table saw to cut your bevels. Just do it prior to making the inside cuts. Running through a lot of sanding belts? Try using a belt cleaning stick. It really prolongs the belt's life by removing old debris and gives your sander a second wind. Want to add a kick to your clocks? Well, light them up. A small miniature light set is an inexpensive item that you can use on fretwork clocks to give the appearance of lights on the inside. At night, with all the lights off in the room, it casts fretwork shadows on the walls and looks great. And when it comes to clocks, you can really spice them up by using contrasting woods. Note that on the chimes of Normandy and the dome clock, I've used black walnut in the area around the clock dial. You can also set off fretwork by placing small cut mirrors or colored fabric behind the intricate areas of your work. Need a wide cheap wood to learn on? If you want to use something other than pine, try western cedar. It's pretty cheap around here on a foot per foot basis, and it allows you to learn to cut on super soft wood. Plus, it smells great when cut. If you can make intricate cuts on it, you can certainly handle the hardwood. And be sure to have plenty of clamps on hand when working projects. Clamps are like a third and fourth hand and it's also an absolute necessity when putting some projects together. Have a good variety of sizes from small to large. Also, 90 degree clamps are especially useful when putting together 45 degree walls like on the big clocks.